I don't know how the sound quality is going to be on this one because I haven't got my usual high tech microphones all plugged in. Recording in progress. Fantastic. All right, so let's begin in our usual fashion. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, you want to pray and to speak and to listen. So we're going to pray and speak and listen with you. Come, divine will. Come, speak in my speaking. Come, listen in our listening. Come, breathe in our breathing. Come, think in our thinking. O oh, Jesus, I give you the little pebble of my will in exchange for the gift of living in your divine will. O oh, Jesus, I fuse myself into your will. Fuse into your will my every thought, every word I speak, every breath I take, every heartbeat, the flow of my blood. I fuse into your will my memory, intellect and will. I fuse into your will every act that I have done this day every act I am doing and every act that I will do. Make an act of abandonment to your divine will, Lord Jesus, and an act of resignation to your will. Our Lady, Queen of the Divine Will, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Servant of God, Louisa Bigoretta, pray for us. Saint Hannibal de Fancia, pray for us. Now, have I got? I've got loads of Louisa's beatificate. There we go. I knew I'd have it here somewhere. So prayer to the Holy Trinity for the glorification of the servant of God, Louisa Bicaretta. <clears throat> o August and Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and thank you for the gift of the holiness of your faithful servant, Louisa Bicaretta. She lived, O Father, in your divine will, becoming under the action of the Holy Spirit, in conformity with your Son, obedient even to death on the cross, victim and host, pleasing to you. Thus cooperating in the redemption and the work of redemption of mankind, her virtues of obedience, humility, supreme love for Christ and the Church, lead us to ask you for the gift of her glorification on earth, so that your glory may shine before all, and your kingdom of truth, justice and love may spread all over the world in the particular charisma of the fiat voluntas tua, secuti in cielo et in terra. We appeal to her merits to obtain from most holy trinity the particular grace for which we pray to you with the intention to fulfill your divine will. Amen. And tonight, the grace I'm going to ask you all to pray for is to keep your interior gaze fixed on Jesus. And that is what I'm going to spend the next hour talking about. Keeping your interior gaze fixed on Jesus. In the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I can't keep up sometimes with the new names that we get. So you're very welcome if this is your first time here. Praise Jesus. Um, so, if you've got access to the volumes, I'm looking at volume 5, <clears throat> June the 30th, 1903. So, volume 5, June the 30th, 1903. And the entry is headlined, The Most Holy Virgin Teaches the Soul. How to keep her interior gaze fixed on Jesus. The beauty of the interior soul. Um, so I'll go through it and I'm going to go through it step by step. I'm not going to rush through it. I'm going to, I've got my Bible with me as well. So if you've got a Bible with you as well. Um, I'm going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 2 Corinthians chapter 3 okay um, I'll keep an eye on people who might come in late and might have to repeat myself once or twice now notice Louisa's language 
She begins by saying, as I was outside of myself. But the teaching is about the interior gate. So there's an exterior and an interior. And she says, I saw the Queen Mother. And prostrating myself at her feet, I said to her, My most sweet mother, in what terrible constraints I find myself, deprived of my only good and of my very life, I am feel I feel I am touching the extremes. Now I want you to pause there and think carefully about um Look Look at what Louise is saying to Mary. She's speaking about the, the terrible constraint that she's in. And she's speaking completely about Jesus. And contrast that with how we can be. You know, when I'm on my travels, when I meet with people, they talk, they talk about all the worries of life, all the different issues of life whether it's family work health and um, all the different concerns louise's number one um problem here is the absence of jesus and that eventually that needs to become ours that needs to be where we are at that's the grace that we need to be asking for so that the number one problem we have in life is the privation of Christ that's the number one thing now while saying this I was crying and the most holy virgin I'm just going to put my other glasses on because uh, I'm getting old and I can't see the words clearly <laughs> I'm kind of stuck here because this is now clear, but the screen is slightly blurred. <laughs> so I'm kind of up the creek without a paddle. <laughs> um, while saying this, I was crying, and the Most Holy Virgin opening herself at the place of her heart, as if opening a tabernacle, took the baby from within it and gave him to me. Now, the word tabernacle, the, um, I was doing a study at the weekend, I was giving a conference on the Divine One in Chicago at the weekend, and I was doing a study on the word steward. Oh, thank you, Teresa, you're a bit late, but here we go, thank you for asking. Uh, we are on uh, volume 5, June the 30th, 1903. Okay, volume 5, June the 30th, 1903. Um, so, at the weekend, I was doing a study on the word steward. Um, and the Greek word is steward is oikonomos. It's a bit of a long word. It's made up of two words, and it is relevant. So, the first word is oikos, and the second word is nomos. Oikos can translate as tabernacle. And nomos is the Greek is the Greek word for commandments or law, the Torah. So the word for steward is one who is a tabernacle. Ooh. One who is a tabernacle of the word. They were steward of the word. Now look at Our Lady. Our Lady has got Jesus in the tabernacle of her heart. And this is what John Paul II says about the incarnation. He says that before Mary conceived Jesus in her womb, she conceived him in her heart. And he tells us to do the same. He says we must conceive Jesus in our hearts. And he talks, of, and there's a reference, if you'd like, to the Eucharist, which we will come to. The Eucharist feeds into this particular narrative we're talking about here. 
So in order to receive Jesus fully in communion, he must first be conceived in the heart. The heart must become a tabernacle. Okay, it must become an oikos. And at the weekend, I was telling the group that God has given us an incredible grace. And our first Pope, Peter, said, we must be good stewards of the grace. God has given you a great grace with the gift of living in the divine will. And your challenge, your task is to be a good steward of that grace. A good steward. Now, a few years ago, I was on an incredible retreat in Walsingham. The, the retreat giver was a monk who was giving spiritual direction to Mother Teresa's order. And he spoke um, about silence and poverty and solitude and the silence and poverty of the Walsingham Shrine. And he spoke about the necessity to be a good steward of what God is giving. Now, there's a sentence he used. I've got it written down here. We need Our Lady to help us listen properly to Christ, to help us not to spoil the graces given. Okay. We need Our Lady to help us to listen properly to Christ, to help us not to spoil the graces given. And I've been listening to Father Joseph Inutzi in recent weeks, and he has issued cautions to the children of the divine will regarding division and the such like. And this is where we can spoil this incredible gift that God has given us, the grace of the gift of living in the divine will, where we can be too focused on what's happening exteriorly in the church and in the world and not focused upon what God is doing interiorly within us, which is really what our focus needs to be, okay? So let me go through this. Our Lady opens up her heart as if she's opening up the tabernacle. She takes the baby from within it and gives him to Louisa and to you. Remember, if those of you who have read the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will, when Our Lady gives birth, if you remember, oh, you're doing that at the moment, Lloyd. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. It's a beautiful meditation. Now, if my memory serves me right, when Our Lady gives birth to Jesus, she does not keep him to herself, but she lays him in the manger so that all can have access to him. This is not done for the purpose of self-gratification. We have to be really careful. This is done so that we can access the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and all the graces he wants to offer us. And we have a responsibility to steward the grace just as our lady did by our lady placing jesus in the manger she is being a good steward of the grace given by offering him to the world we have to be a good steward of the grace that god has given us and we often look at the people of israel and how when they went into the desert having been set free from slavery and how they complained and moaned and groaned and grumbled. I see children of the divine will doing this very same thing about the church and other things. We can't be like this. God has given us the greatest gift in the history of the world. We have a responsibility to grow in our interiority and to be non-complaining non-grumbling, non-criticizing, grateful and thankful. Now I'm pointing the finger at myself as much as anything else. I'm really, honestly, I am speaking to myself as much as I'm talking to you here because I know my wife will tell you when I'm on a downer, I can be the world's worst critic. 
so I have to go to confession about it regularly. But I'm just teaching you here as well, okay, in the context of what Our Lady is teaching. Now, Louisa says, my daughter, do not cry. Here is your good, your life, your all. Okay, that's the goal. And you might say to yourself, if I could use this become my good, my life, my all, how can that happen? It is a grace. Um, I think I've mentioned it, that during Lent I was meditating upon the dark night of the soul and the dark night of the spirit by St. John of the Cross. John of the Cross keeps repeating a certain phrase, the sheer grace, recognising that this entire journey is a sheer grace. So when we want Jesus to become our good, our life and our all, it's because it's a grace offered to the soul. God wants to give you this grace, but he needs you to be disposed towards the grace. He can give you all these graces, but we need to be disposed. We need to be prepared to receive everything that God wants to give us. Now, our, our Lady says to you, as much as to Louisa, take him. And if I go to, if I go to the Last Supper, and don't forget, it's, it's less than two weeks since Monday Thursday. As they are eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take very same word used by our lady here take take him keep him at the last supper says jesus says this is my body take it eat it so this is where god is actually giving us everything and we have to decide how am i going to be responding to what God is giving me here. How do I respond? It's a challenge to the soul. We have to be careful. Like I, I quote I quote again what this beautiful monk said. We have to ask Our Lady's help not to spoil the graces that God is giving us. We have to ask Our Lady to help us to be good stewards of the graces being given or the graces being offered. Take him and keep him always with you. As you keep him with you, keep your interior gaze fixed on him. Keep your interior gaze fixed on him. That is the solution. Okay. If I go to Psalm 63, I hope you're keeping up. Psalm 63, verse 2. Verse 2, verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. So he's gazing upon God in the sanctuary for a purpose. What does this gazing do? What good does it do to look at Jesus interiorly? What good does it do? Well, let's take a look. Do not be embarrassed if he does not tell you anything or if you are unable to say anything. Just for those, there's a couple of new people just come on board. So just for your benefit, we're on Diary Entry, Volume 5, June the 30th, 1903. Okay. Volume 5, June the 30th, 1903. Do not be embarrassed if it does not tell you anything or if you're unable to say anything. Now, think about it. The amount of times you come to prayer... And we are either going to say something to God, or we want God to speak to us. <coughs> Our Lady says, 
Don't be embarrassed if you've got nothing to say to him and if he says nothing to you. That's from the Queen. Okay, so we need to take those words to heart. It's important because John of the Cross says that the only way into this journey is silence. It's the only way. That's been the only way for thousands of years. Just look at him in your interior and by looking at him you will comprehend everything. Look at him in your interior and by looking at him you will comprehend everything. By gazing at Jesus, she gives him the, she gives Louisa the baby Jesus, she gives you the baby Jesus. She says just by looking at the baby Jesus you will comprehend everything. Now Ladies, I'm going to, I'm going to um, draw your memory, draw on your memory. Those of you who have had children, babies, and when you've been nursing the baby, whether it was at the breast or at the bottle, or whether it was just holding the baby, when you held that baby and you were gazing at that baby and i have to tell you this happened to me so it's not just for the ladies this is also for the men this happened to me did not the world vanish yeah completely vanished everything vanished just looking at the baby just looking at my children katie hannah michael sammy when they were babies the world vanished everything vanished it was just me and the baby you're the same the same now with jesus mary offers us jesus perpetually tells us to keep our gaze fixed on him perpetually and we will comprehend everything okay i'll repeat it again for those who've come on board late again because i can see a few more have joined us Volume 5, June the 30th, 1903. Now, I'm now going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm going to go from verse 15. To this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. And that actually should draw to mind the veil hanging over the tabernacle but when a man turns to the lord the veil is removed by grace it's removed by grace now the lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom and we all with unveiled face Behold, the glory of the Lord are being changed into his likeness. So all we are doing is gazing. So the word behold, with unveiled face, we are beholding the glory of the Lord or gazing upon the Lord. That gazing upon the Lord enables us to be changed into his likeness or transformed. The Greek word is metamorpho. It means to be transformed. It occurs four times in the New Testament. Metamorpho. It occurs when Jesus is transfigured on Mount Sinai. There's two instances of that in the Gospels. The word for transfigured is metamorpho. So when Jesus is transfigured, there's a metamorpho takes place. So in the New Testament, the word metamorpho occurs twice for Jesus and twice for us. So metamorpho on Mount Tabor happens twice. It happens here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You're being trans by gazing upon him, you are transformed, metamorpho into his likeness. It happens in Romans chapter 12. And it's to do with the transformation of the mind. As we meditate upon God's word, our mind is being renewed. So he actually says, 
be transformed by the renewal of your mind so you may discern the will of God. Okay, be transformed by the renewal of your mind so you may discern the will of God. Now, you live in a world which wants to criticize, condemn, judge, gossip, slander, and hate, and everything else. But you live in a kingdom where the queen of that kingdom is telling you to gaze upon her son and you will comprehend everything. And she says she gives you her son, she takes her son out of her heart, the tabernacle of her heart, she offers him to you and she says take him and keep him and keep your interior gaze fixed upon him you will comprehend everything let's keep reading it you will do everything you will satisfy for all now note this is volume 5 written in 1903 Louisa has not yet been introduced to the science of the divine will that i from my reading that starts to unfold in volume six so at the moment she has not yet been introduced to the science of doing everything for everybody maybe wrong i'll take correction if i am but that's what i've kind of read so far but our lady says you will comprehend everything, you will do everything, you will satisfy for all. This is the beauty of the interior soul. This is the beauty of the interior soul. Now, if I go back to the retreats given by this beautiful monk, he talks about the interiority. <clears throat> he says... Hmm. Just bear with me. There is no opposition between an apostolic life and that of a deep, silent community. Communion. Silent interiority is drinking from the source of grace. And the kingdom we are being offered is one of interiority. The kingdom you're being offered is one of interiority. The queen of that kingdom is telling you to enter in. To enter within the queen of that kingdom. Think about how, for those of you who know about the, the late Queen of England, think about how every Christmas she would give a Christmas message to everybody who belonged to the Commonwealth. And millions of people would tune in to that Christmas message. And often, our late Queen would have a Bible open on her desk and on many occasions would proclaim Jesus as her Lord and Saviour. I know people find fault with the late queen, but I prefer to look at the good things that she would speak about. This is the beauty of the interior soul. Without voice, without education. How many of our saints had no education? How many of our great saints had no education? Since there is no external thing that attracts her or upsets her. Once again, just, just think about the things that are happening in the world at the moment. <clears throat> things are going to get much, much worse. And there is absolutely no point in us rehearsing our grievances and complaints about it all. It's pointless. You can't change a thing. The whole thing we know is going to collapse. So we have to say, okay, where do I go? I flee within. 
I flee to the kingdom within. That's the place of safety. That's the refuge. The true refuge. All of her attraction, all of her goods are enclosed in her interior. By simply looking at Jesus, she easily comprehends everything and does everything. Now, you might not be inclined towards this language. You might not be practicing this. But when the, the nature of catechesis in the Catholic Church is that when all instruction is given, like the instruction I'm giving you now, God gives you the grace that goes with the message being proclaimed. It's a bit like if you have a meal, right? If you're having a, a healthy dinner, the, you can look at the external colours, the flavours, the smells of the food. But the real benefit of what you've got in front of you is the vitamins, the minerals, the health benefits of the food. If you like, the grace of the food. Now, it's the same with the word. You're hearing a message. That's like the flavour. It's like the smell. You're hearing it. But within the word is contained the grace, the nourishment. So God enables you to do the message you are hearing. Think of it like this. In the background of the charismatic renewal, we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What use would it be if you're talking about something like the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but people aren't experiencing it? So we have the experience, the encounter with God in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And whenever the, whenever the message is proclaimed, God shows up with his power. Well, here the message is proclaimed and God is showing up with his power. So don't think that I'm just teaching you about something which is going to be out of your reach. It isn't. As I'm teaching this, God is giving you the grace to live what he is teaching you. To actually enter into a deeper interiority and to be able to gaze upon Jesus in your interior life and to be able to comprehend everything that Jesus wants to teach you. That this is this is logical. Think about it. Why would Jesus want to give us all these 36 volumes and everything else that Louisa wrote for it all to be beyond that comprehension? It's pretty useless. But then Jesus has to give us keys. And one of the keys he's giving us here, one of the key, the key that the Queen of Heaven gives us, the, que the key that the Queen, and I know so many people into the Divine Will are totally devoted and consecrated to Mary. Well, your, que your Queen, the one you've consecrated yourselves to, is giving you a phenomenal key to opening up the treasures of the Divine Will. She says, the Queen says, by gazing upon him, you will comprehend everything. By gazing upon him, you will comprehend everything. All of your attraction, all of your goods are enclosed in your interior life. All of your goods, everything in this world is fading. It's constantly fading. All the goods that you have in your life, the chances are none of them existed a few centuries ago. And none of them will exist in the not too distant future. But what you have in your interior life, the graces in your interior life, have always existed in God from all eternity. And they will continue to exist for all eternity. 
The kingdom of the divine will has always existed and always will. And God is just establishing it in your soul for all eternity. By simply looking at Jesus, she easily comprehends everything and does everything. Now, now comes the difficulty. I've given you all the nice, tasty stuff, but now I'm going to give you the, the cup of bitterness that comes after the meal. All right. Well, actually, no, I'm not. This is from the Blessed Virgin Mary, so you can blame her <laughs> if you dare. In this way, you will walk up to the top of Calvary. Now, have you ever thought to yourself, how am I ever going to walk the way of the cross? How am I ever going to carry my own crosses? This is it. Our Lady says it. By simply gazing upon Jesus in your interiority, in this way, you will walk to the top of Calvary. It is simple. The way of contemplation. You will walk the top of Calvary. And once we reach it, notice the word we, Our Lady walking with you. You having Jesus in your heart, Our Lady with Jesus in the tabernacle of her heart. You will no longer see him as a baby, but crucified. So that walk up Calvary would cause you to be to grow to the full stature in Christ, which is a phrase used in the Word of God, to be to grow to full maturity in Christ. So Christ in you will grow from being a baby. Think about it: how you would be your relationship with a baby, and how it's there's a lot of consolations, a lot of love, sleepless nights, yes, but there's lots of consolations and cuddles and kisses and fun and love and so on. But Our Lady wants you to come to know Christ crucified because Christ baby has not saved the world. Christ crucified has. And we need to come to know Jesus as the one who saves us every moment of every day. And for the fullness of that salvation to be made manifest in our lives, not just a portion of it, you know, not just, oh yeah, Jesus has saved me. No, that salvation needs to penetrate into the very depths of our being and it needs to, the cross needs to be in every cell in the body, in every area of the soul. Now, you will no longer see him as a baby, but crucified, and you will be crucified together with him. You will remain crucified together with him. How do you get to be crucified with Jesus? You gaze upon him. As you gaze upon him, you're transformed into him as from one degree of glory to another. Now, look at the word glory. Um, once again, there's so many misunderstandings about this because of our Pentecostal brothers and sisters. When they talk about the glory of Christ, they talk about the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit, the consolation of the Holy Spirit, the encounter in the senses, the feelings and emotions. It's all consolation. When Christ talks about his glory, he's talking about his cross. He's talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about his death. When, he, when the Greeks approach Jesus in John 12, they approach the disciples and say, we want to see Jesus. And Jesus' response is, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. In other words, I'm going to be crucified. That's the glory. There we go. That's the glory. So it's upside down in comparison with the way of the world. The glory of the world is the football stars holding up a metal cup and having the adulation of the crowds. The glory of Jesus is being nailed to the cross and having the scourge, the, the hatred and the violence of the crowd. That's the glory of God. Because 
it's like John of the Cross says in the dark night of the spirit, God draws out all the poison of the soul and we realize that deep within us there is great evil that hates God. And that has to be purified before we can enter into a deep communion with him. So God has to draw out the person in us who hammers in the nails. That person has to be revealed and put to death on the cross. So that person has to be completely saved and redeemed. And we have to realize that that's in us. So many people deny that. That denial is incredibly unhealthy. We have to realize the full extent of the evil that is in our soul and it's only revealed through a bright light. That bright light comes through gazing upon the child Jesus. It's a simple message, right? It's not complicated. It's a very simple message. And it's not even from me. It's from Our Lady. So it seemed that with the baby in my arms and together with the Most Holy Virgin, we walked the way of Calvary, which I think a few of you would have done during Lent. You'd have probably done the way of the cross with Mary, if you, especially if you did the hours of the Passion. She shows up every now and then. While walking, now listen to this, this is an important thing for you now, because this is, um, this is where Jesus can be snatched from your hands. While walking at times, I'd find someone who wanted to take Jesus away from me. The temptations of the devil, the temptations of our friends and family, the temptations of our enemies, the temptations of ourselves. We ourselves put ourselves to temptation. We let ourselves be tempted without anyone else having recourse, just me and my interior, that temptation is someone trying to take Jesus away from me, taking me out of a state of grace, trying to rob me of all the graces that God has given me. So what do we do? Louisa says, I would call the Queen Mother. And if I go back to the very beginning, where I was quoting from the back of this Bible, this retreat, Um, uh, we need Our Lady to help us to listen properly to Christ, to help us not to spoil the graces given, to help us not to lose Jesus. Now further down it says this, Our Lady educates us in this which is alien to us. Our Lady educates us. Think about Our Lady's appearances at Medjugorje and Fatima and Lourdes and Garbandal and La Salette, um, Guadalupe, Kibejo, um, all these other places where she's educating us. She's teaching us. Every time she comes, she's teaching us. I will call the Queen Mother to my help, saying to her, my mama, help me. For they want to snatch Jesus away from me. Now, Jesus, remember, he says, your enemies will be the members of your own household. You yourself are your enemy. That's a tough pill to swallow. If you can get it, you will make great progress. You yourself are your enemy. Jesus is within you. But so is your enemy. The member, your enemies will be the members of your own household. Now, what John of the Cross teaches us is that the members of the household are put to sleep in order that the soul can move forward and progress. The, the members of the soul are put to sleep. The senses are put to rest. She would answer me, do not fear. Your care must be in keeping your interior gaze fixed on him. Now, if you go back two verses, I would find someone who wanted to take Jesus from me. 
What has Louisa done? She's taken her eyes off Jesus and she has found someone who wants to take Jesus away. And she says, your solution, your care must be in keeping your gaze fixed on Jesus. I gaze upon you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. This has so much power that all other powers, human and diabolical, remain debilitated and defeated. By simply gazing upon Jesus in the interior life, you defeat all other powers. There is no need to shout, kick, scream, punch, shoot, explode, nothing else. By keeping your gaze fixed on Jesus constantly in your interior life, which is a grace from God, you might say, how can I keep my gaze perpetually fixed on Jesus? It is a grace that God wants to give to you in order for you to ascend Calvary and take possession of the kingdom of the divine will. God simply wants you to receive the grace. So don't say, there's no way I could do this. That is pride speaking. Okay, Pride is, there is no way I can do this. Humility is, Blessed Mother, please give me the grace to keep my gaze fixed on Jesus. Because humility is when you turn to Jesus, God, Our Lady, your angel, the saints. It's when you recognize the need for the help of another, more powerful than you. So we turn to Our Lady. Our Lady gives us a lesson. All other powers... Human and diabolical remain debilitated and defeated. You defeat the enemy by simply keeping your gaze on Jesus. Now, while we were walking, we found a temple. Now, look at the beauty. The narrative begins with Our Lady opening a tabernacle, and it concludes with them both finding. A temple. The word that I used earlier, oikos, the root word for the word oikonomos, can mean tabernacle or temple. So Our Lady's heart is a tabernacle in which Jesus was found. Now they found a temple in which Holy Mass was being celebrated. At the time of Holy Communion, I flew to the altar. Now notice early in the early in the narrative um, they were walking the way of Calvary. But now they've got to the place of communion, Louisa flies. This is not unusual language. Uh, if I go to the Song of Songs, chapter 1, one of my favourite words, scriptures from the Bible. Draw, this is Song of Songs 1, verse 4. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his wedding chamber. In the 9 p.m. hour of the Passion, Louisa walks, runs, and flies. I flew to the altar with the baby in my arms in order to receive communion. But what was not my surprise, when as soon as Jesus Christ entered into me, he disappeared from my arms. After a little while, I found myself inside myself. So Jesus has disappeared. But once again, I'm going to go back to this beautiful retreat I was at some years ago.
Spiritual love hides. It is a game of hide and seek. In the Song of Songs, you find the loved one seeking her lover, going out on the streets at night, asking the watchmen, have you seen him? When you get to the resurrection appearances that we've been talking about, we have Mary Magdalene going to the tomb and then going to the gardener. They've taken my loved one. Where have you put him? And he reveals himself to Mary Magdalene. But then he says, don't cling to me. Go and tell the others. Now, have you ever considered, have you ever considered, we've just read these narratives in, in the Easter octave, have you ever considered that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene and then sends her to the apostles? before he goes himself and then he hides himself from Mary Magdalene and the Apostles and he keeps appearing and disappearing appearing and disappearing this is this is the way Jesus is with us he hides himself from Louisa all the time the hiding that happens is a painful but profound and necessary purification and suffering for the soul and saint john of the cross talks about this a lot talks about the grace of god being hidden and the purification that it causes so it happens here she was surprised as soon as Jesus entered into me, he disappeared from my arms. So she's been carrying the baby Jesus all this time up Calvary, walking with Mary. And then as soon as she receives communion, Jesus disappears. Then after a little while, I found myself inside myself. The very next entry begins... This morning I was highly afflicted because of the loss of my adorable Jesus. All of a sudden, he made himself seen in my interior. And Our Lady has just been talking about finding Jesus in the interior. If we go to the resurrection appearances, the disciples are in the upper room. Suddenly, Jesus appears. The disciples go fishing. Jesus appears on the beach. It's always unexpected. It's always a surprise. Like us with our consolations that Jesus might give us. We could be feeling really down, tempted, tried, under siege, battling, feeling like we're losing the battle. And then suddenly, without warning... The master of the Lord of Armies arrives on the scene. The storm is silenced. The battle won. Peace comes. What does Our Lady say to you throughout all of this? She says, even when you can't see him, keep your gaze fixed on him. How do you do that? How do you keep your gaze fixed on Jesus when you can't see him? How do you do it? Well, think about how you can go to church and you can go during the time of adoration and the Blessed Sacrament is exposed on the altar. But then what about when the Blessed Sacrament is not on the altar? You can sit in front of the tabernacle and you can gaze upon the hidden Christ. That's when Jesus loves to be kept company. What if the church is shut? You can sit outside the church and gaze upon Jesus hidden in the church. You can go online and you can get adoration online. It doesn't feel the same. But you've got to get over your feelings. You're not, you're not to be governed by your feelings. They will do nothing but deceive you. You have to just follow Our Lady's instructions. Gaze upon the one who is hidden. 
but this is something very simple you can do. You've got, I've got the Bible here, the inspired Word of God, and I've got the volumes here, the private revelations given to Louisa, locutions from Jesus and Mary. By reading the Word of God in this way, we are gazing upon the face of God. So if I just go to volume, it's on the same page, August the 3rd, 1903, I can read this. The more the soul strips herself of natural things, the more of the supernatural and divine things she acquires. I can gaze upon it. I'm gazing upon the face of Christ. And as I gaze upon it, the grace of the word that I'm gazing upon has its effect in my soul. This is why I keep telling you to ruminate and to masticate because this is the only way you will be nourished by the word. The only way. If you do not ruminate on the word this is science this isn't just from these books this is science this is if you if you google ruminate it will tell you that if ruminants do not ruminate they remain small and weak when you ruminate properly you grow strong and healthy and ruminating is not difficult to do. It is not. You, you're not being asked to go outside and build a building or dig a huge hole in the ground. You're not being asked to get muddy and sweaty and achy and everything else. You're just being asked to read the word over and over and over. That's all you're being asked to do. So it's not that difficult. Now, Helen, thank you. You popped on the chat. There is the rosary. Yes, John Paul II, in his document on the rosary, written around the year 2002, told us that as we pray the rosary, we are contemplating the face of Christ and we're contemplating it with Mary, just like what we've just done in this narrative. But that's where the rosary must become contemplative, not a Formula One racetrack, <laughs> okay? must be contemplated and my wife's laughing looking at me because i know that sometimes when we pray it at home i'm like a formula one race driver <laughs> so there you go i confess my guilt to the class now uh it's two minutes to go are there any questions at the end that people would like to ask before i proceed for the record i'm here in america giving a several conferences on the divine will and today i'm in where am i <laughs> i'm somewhere in north carolina and it's very disappointing i was hoping it was going to be 30 degrees centigrade but it's just like british spring weather it's overcast <laughs> so you come all the way to north carolina and you get birmingham weather hallelujah <laughs> did i just complain after telling you all not to complain <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. My wife and my sister in law are both glaring at me, darling, darling, darling. Well, not, not glaring, they're looking at me to say, Yeah, we know. <laughs> okay, so no questions coming through. So, what I'm going to do then is pray for you all. Okay, so I have brought with me Laval Narata. She's been traveling with me. So, I've got the cross here as well. But I'm going to be holding up La Vulnerata, Our Lady the Wounded. Our Lady is the one who has been teaching us today. So we're going to ask Our Lady, Dearest Mother Mary, Jesus wants to pray, so I'm going to pray with Jesus. Come, divine will, come pray in my praying. Dearest Mother Mary, Will you please give us all the grace 
of the word that has just been spoken. Give us all the grace to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in our interiority. So that we can ascend Calvary and be crucified with your Son and resurrected anew in the divine will. Help us to resist the urge to, as Louisa writes, to find someone who wants to take Jesus from us. It's interesting language. Help us to pull away from the desire to find someone or something that will take Jesus away from us, that will take us out of the state of grace, take us away from the kingdom. And help us instead just to be careful in keeping our gaze fixed on him and to recognize that just by doing that, all powers fall down in front of us. Thank you, Blessed Mother, for that beautiful grace. And I'm going to put Our Lady here because I'm recording this on my mobile. So I'm going to hold her there as I finish the session, right in front of where the mobile phone is, so that people on YouTube can also see this and ask for that grace. And we all give Our Lady our fiat voluntas to her. Recording stop. There we go. It feels really weird, this, because it is three o'clock in the afternoon. 